All right, good afternoon, everyone. Of course, it could be morning where you're at with the different time zones. Welcome to Tuesday Explorers, a series of lifelong learning opportunities brought to you by AARP Virginia. I'm Suba Sadi, an ARP volunteer community ambassador with ARP Virginia in Fairfax, Virginia. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that empowers people to choose how they live as they age. We're here to make your voice heard and provide information and resources on the issues that matter and to connect you with fun learning opportunities. We provide valuable educational, informational and fun resources, things like webinars, teletown halls, discounts and more. When it's safe to host in-person events, you'll be invited to attend. In the meantime, ARP will continue to offer programs virtually. Studies have shown that challenging your brain in new ways throughout life may strengthen your brain. Our brain is stimulated and makes new connections when we learn new things or pursue new interests. ARP encourage you, encourages you to stay curious and give yourself a good mental workout by doing something that challenges your thinking, offers you enjoyment, and encourages you to grapple with new and complex ideas. While this program may, may not be sufficiently rigorous to be, to be defined as a cognitively stimulating activity, it's important to note that it is never too late to seek out a new activity that challenges the way you think. So we applaud and thank you for joining us today. So before we start, get started on today's program, I have a few housekeeping items to review with you. Please put yourself on mute. We will have time for Q&A at the end of today's presentation. So we'll take that via chat and Trudy and I will read that to our presenter. If you're trying to multitask or moving around, please turn your camera off. Now onto our program. It is my pleasure to introduce and welcome back our guest speaker, Chris Goddard. Chris Goddard has loved aviation his whole life. He first flew at the age of 17 years old and decided to pursue an, pursue an aviation degree following high school. After college, life took him in another direction, but he always maintained his love of everything airplanes and aviation in general. He is retired from Fairfax County Public Schools here in Virginia, where he worked as a technology specialist for over 20 years. Chris enjoys passing on his love of aviation to others by volunteering at the National Air and Space Museum Stephen F. Edvar Hazy Center in Chantilly, Virginia, and also as a national park volunteer at the Wright Brothers National Memorial Park in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Today, Chris will tell us the rest of the stories about the Wright Brothers. So please give a virtual warm welcome to Chris, and Chris, the screen is yours. Thank you, Suva. Um, so yeah, this is part two, but I think looking at the number of participants, there may some maybe some people who didn't get part one. So hopefully, we, you know, where we ended it last time was at the end of 1900. Uh, and when they had taken their first trip to Kitty Hawk and tested their big glider with the control systems that they had uh, devised. Uh, Wilbur was communicating with another gentleman interested in aviation, Octave Chanute. And also at this point where we left the story, they had just hired someone to look after their bicycle shop while they could go down to North Carolina. They wanted to go down a little bit earlier this year in 1901. Uh, in June, Wilbur actually wrote to Chanute and told him, you know, owing to changes in our business arrangements, we shall start our trip much earlier than we expected. The bicycle business is how they made their money. They did you know, quite all right with that. Um, so I think at this point, you know, it, it's one of those moments, in my opinion anyway, that hiring someone to run your business while you're off working on what is supposed to be a hobby is kind of out of character for the brothers. They were very careful with their finances. So I think, this clearly shows at this time a shift in their priorities. Um, Octave Chanute proposed sending two men to meet them at Kitty Hawk this year. One uh, himself plus his own builder, Edward Huffaker. And the other was a physician 
who fancied himself an engineer named George Pratt. Wilbur quickly replied, he said, you know, we don't really need any help. We're okay in that, but we would be thankful for the company. So uh, if you want to come visit, that would be all right. Uh, Chanute loaned them his top of the line anemometer, the, the thing that measures wind speed, an inclinometer. They left for North Carolina in 1901 on July 7th. Uh, if you remember the first time they went, Wilbur, it took him seven days to get there because of the hurricane and everything. Well, this time when they got to Elizabeth City, oh, and now just a quick recap in case you forgot, uh, how did they get to North Carolina, to, to Kitty Hawk? They took a train from um, Dayton to Cincinnati, because in Cincinnati, they could get an overnight train direct to Norfolk. In Norfolk, they crossed uh, the mouth of the river on the Pennsylvania steamer. And then they took another train to Elizabeth City. And in Elizabeth City, there was a weekly, every Wednesday, a weekly boat that would go down to Kitty Hawk. Um, although the first time Wilbur just hired someone to take him down since it wasn't on a Wednesday. He wasn't aware of that. Uh, but this time they left for North Carolina together on July 7th. And now when they got to, her, to Elizabeth City, another hurricane came through. They're just not having a lot of luck. Uh, just, you know, for the sake of it, they went outside, held up the anemometer, and it registered 93 miles an hour. So they were delayed by a couple of days, but once the storm passed, the rest of the trip was uneventful. Work on the hangar uh, for the new glider began on July 15th. You remember the year before they only had the tent, but now they started working on the hangar so they could actually do the work on the glider inside a hangar. Uh, they were completed within three days. Now, left to right here, you can see the guy sitting down looking at the camera with a hat on. That's Octave Chanute. Uh, next to him, leaning back with his hands on his knee, that's Orville. Next to Orville is Huffaker, uh, Edward Huffaker. And standing up is Wilbur. Um, and it's interesting because right about the time when Chanute and the other two gentlemen arrived, so did a swarm of mosquitoes. They, now they all slept under some netting, but this is one of those little things I want to share because it's kind of funny. And the way they wrote, you know, when they wrote in their diary, this is a funny anecdote by Orville on, on all the mosquitoes at night. He says, quote, um, our astonishment was when in a few minutes we heard a terrific slap and a cry from Mr. Huffaker announcing that the enemy had gained the outer works and he was now engaged in hand-to-hand -hand conflict with them. All our forces were put to complete rout. I mean, how cool is that that you describe, you know, he's fighting the mosquitoes. Our enemy has gained the outer works. Anyway, the building of the glider was completed by July 26th. On the 27th, they began their flight tests. Uh, George Pratt had arrived on the 25th, and like the previous year, though, Wilbur is the only pilot. Uh, they were immediately disappointed. The craft was prone to stalling, and Wilbur had to maintain full up elevator just to keep it steady. They stopped the manned flights, and they flew it as a glider gathering data. Um, it just you know, seemed to be too dangerous to be on the machine at this point. So they continued to fly it as a glider. The new glider only produced about one third of the lift that they thought they were going to get by their calculations. And also it generated more drag than they thought. They began to think that something was wrong with the table that they had used for multilinear thought. After a week or more or so of the more flight tests, their fears were confirmed. So they stopped testing 
and they made some drastic changes to the aircraft while they were there. They removed the front spars, changed the shape of the leading edges. Um, they just worked to try to improve the lift and reduce the drag. Octave Chanut saw these and was very impressed with what the boys were trying to do. They were able to reduce the drag and the machine responded much better to the controls. On August 8th, the brothers tried a new means of launching the glider. They would kite it up to an altitude of about 20, 30 feet up on the, the side of the hill. And when the wind got to about 17 to 20 miles an hour, they cut it loose and glide back down to earth. Uh, this is Wilbur on the machine. And by now he's able to stretch his gliding distance to about 389 feet, almost 400 feet. Chanute left on August 11th. Uh, four days later, Wilbur tried to make a few intentional turns using his warping system during one of the flights. But this produced really an unpleasant surprise. When warping was introduced, trying to turn, Wilbur sensed that the machine was skidding towards the wing that presented the most surface. It's, you know, it's a slip, uh, uh, he's skidding in the, in the turn. Um, nowadays in aviation, they call that adverse yaw. It's a tendency of the aircraft's nose to swing in the, operate, in the, in the opposite direction of a turn. Uh, Wilbur would try to turn right, and the glider would yaw left. Uh, there was something else that they couldn't explain. And these experiments ended up producing more questions than answers. Um, for another week or so, the flying did improve. In fact, it grew a little bit more dangerous. And by the time they left Kitty Hawk, in the, by the end of August, 22 August to be specific, um, despite what Chanute and the others that came down thought and were so impressed with it, they, Wilbur and Orville considered their experiments a failure. And at that point, doubt started to creeping their minds as to whether they would continue with this. Um, the problems they had encountered just seemed too complex to overcome. I mean, as far as they were concerned, greater minds, people with greater resources have tried and failed. And you know, who were they to think they could succeed at this? They had more questions than, than answers. Uh, Wilbur told Orville on the train back to Dayton, I don't think within a thousand years a man will ever fly. So that's how the, the, they felt when they got back to Dayton. But not too long after they returned, Wilbur, received an invitation from the um, Chicago Western Society of Engineers. Octave Chanute had told these, this society about the work Wilbur was doing, and they wanted him to come and give him a speech, give him a talk about what the stuff he was doing. And this was a great honor, and you know, it recognized the value of these experiments. But Wilbur, is a shy guy to begin with. And he was inclined to just say thank you, but politely refuse. Uh, I mean, after all, you know, he's disappointed. His stuff is not working. Uh, but a couple of people, including most importantly, the younger sister, Catherine, uh, pushed her brother to be more social and said, you know, you, you got to go do this. Well, they, that's what they called him, Will in the family. You got Will, Orv, and the sister uh, they called Sves, which I guess is a German word for sister or something. But anyway, that's what they called each other. So Wilbur's got this invitation to the Society of Engineers. He's a little reluctant, but Catherine, you know, gives him a little boost, a little kick in the rear and says, you got to go, Will. These people want to hear you. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. You know, so, okay, he accepted it. And he went and gave him the speech. And to his relief, the speech, the speech was called Some Aeronautical Experiments, was extremely well received. They even published a copy of the speech in the prestigious Journal of the Western Society of Engineers. Um, you know, now when he got home, Wilbur had that little boost of energy, you know, that he received from everybody being so 
enthusiastic about what he was talking about. But now, you know, they looked, he looked at Orville and said, okay, well, you know, if we're going to continue to do this, we got to figure out what's wrong. I mean, they, if they declare the late great Otto Lilienthal's figures to be wrong, they had to come up with their own. So the first thing they did was built a balance from a bicycle wheel. You get the feeling at this point, you know, when you look at this contraption here, you're like, well, what have we got around the shot that maybe we could use? Well, they took one of their bicycles. This is a Van Cleef, by the way, one of their own models. Um, they had a couple, they sold others bicycle, but they made two of their own. The Van Cleef and the Sinclair named after their uh, grandparents. Anyway, so you can see they've got uh, one of their uh, bicycle wheels, horizontal, freely turning, and then they put shapes of um, wings on each side. And the purpose was to try to figure out if there's, if lift and drag is equal, the shape will stay where it is. If lift is better than the drag, it will actually move forward. Um, so they tried this with different wing shapes. Now, the way to do this is somebody's got to get on the bicycle and pedal like mad. Uh, this is a color one, obviously. It's not them, it's a reproduction. But um, you could just see that, you know, first of all, if you got to get up to a certain speed trying to get any measurements, that could be pretty tiring after a while. And also, they had a hard time getting really accurate measurements doing this. It only gave them an idea. So what they decided to do was to build a wind tunnel. They built one from an old grinder, scraps of wood. This is their wind, uh, their wind tunnel. Uh, and using, again, what they got in the shop, they used the different spokes of the tire, of the wheels and all that, and they made different shapes of wing and they would test the wing shapes in the tunnel. By mid-December 1901, they made a surprising discovery. Otto Lilienthal, the tables that they thought were completely wrong, was actually not totally wrong. They were okay by and large, but one number in the equation he used to calculate lift was off the mark. It had to do with the air pressure. Wilbur and Orville also found that the shape of the wings, what, what we call the camber, was inefficient. I mean, this was a turning point for them. The wind tunnel experiments were the brothers, and actually anyone, first venture into pure aeronautical science. It was tedious, time consuming, you know, testing one miniature wing shape after another uh, at different angles to the airstream but they made tremendous progress and they were getting answers to the question. Like, you know, not just the shape of the wing, but how large should the wing be? How much is the distance between the two shapes if you're gonna have a biplane? And all of those things. Um, both Wilbur and Orville would later on would look back and speak about this time of the testing and, and the sheer intellectual excitement of, of finding out answers as the peak of their career in aeronautics. Uh, they, they were treading new ground and they knew it. Uh, their new glider was still a biplane. The wing was slightly larger than the 1901 and it had a new design. It was based on wing number 12. The span was 10 feet shorter and the cord two feet shorter. The elevator that makes you go up and down was extended further out in front. This gave them more leverage, translated into better control. Finally, the brothers decided to replace the tail they had abandoned in 1900. That this new glider, the 1902 glider, will have two fixed vertical services behind the aircraft. Um, they thought that that would prevent the yawing and the skidding that, uh, that occurred when they tried to uh, turn the aircraft. 
compared to the, these are the wing shapes, by the way. You can see all the different wing shapes. Look at number 12. That's the one that they chose. And on the, uh, the right side is where they would record the, all their calculations. Um, this is the new glider. You know, you, you, it's starting to look more and more like an airplane, what we know now. Uh, Octave Chanute, they kept the correspondence with him. He was eager to help the brothers. He offered to contact Carnegie for sponsorship, you know, Mr. Money. The brothers said, no, thanks. We don't need sponsorship. We're doing just fine with what we got. Plus, they didn't want to give anybody else the rights to whatever they were going to come up with. So they left Dayton in 1902 again, this time uh, on August 25th, August 25th. They left a little bit later. Uh, the first few days were spent putting their shed back into shape. Here's a picture of their camp. Now, when I'm down in Kitty Hawk, I like to show this picture to the people that come visit there because first of all, what you're seeing are puddles of water. This is after a couple of three days rain. But look at it. I mean, it doesn't look like the Kitty Hawk if you ever go to the Outer Banks, <laughs> you know, but it's amazing. That's it. That picture was taken from the top of the hill where they did their, their gliding experiments. Uh, that's just an amazing picture, I think. But anyway, um, they, ex they you remember first they come down with a tent. And then the following year, the year before 1901, they built a place to work, a hangar. And in 1902, they have a, wait a minute, what if we had made that hangar a little bit bigger? Maybe we wouldn't have to stay in the tent, we could make living quarters. So that's exactly what they did. And they built a loft for sleeping quarters. Uh, work on the new glider began on September 8th. And by September 19, they're making the first uh, flight tests of 1902. Wilbur had done all the flying. Will, uh, Orville is now starting to learn how to fly. There's Orville. And you can see in this picture, by the way, there's the hill in the background of the picture. But that's where he left from. And he's now glided all the way around and is, has made a turn and is heading back to the hill. Um, now, you got to wonder, why didn't Orville fly before? Well, Milton, the dad, always thought at the beginning anyway that this was Wilbur's doing and Orville was really there to help Wilbur, even though the brothers cooperated 100%, because dad thought that Wilbur was afraid that if anything happened to Orville, and you know, this could be a dangerous business. If anything happened to Orville, he would be blamed. So he wouldn't let Orville do any of the flying. But by 1902 now, they're feeling pretty confident. So Orville is doing some of the flying. Um, and, you know, it took him a while to learn. I mean, and he's got his brothers down below yelling at him and how to do it. But by October, they're averaging 25 flights on a good day. Um, and as pleased as they are now with their flights and the distances they're making and the lift, it's still clear the fixed rudder does not solve the skidding problem that they had. So October 3rd, one day lying in little hammock, uh, the bed that they had in, the, in, the, in their living quarters, uh, Wilbur is sleeping, Orville is wide awake, and he's thinking of the problem. And it occurred to him that maybe the fixed rudder might be the cause. He suspected that the fixed rudder might be causing additional drag and therefore slowing down. Uh, the wing leaning into the turn. So that would cause this kid. He suggested the next day to hinge the rudder so that the pilot can control the surface of the rudder to counteract the increased drag. Wilbur not so sure about adding yet another control to the pilot to have to, to do, but they agreed to try to link the rudder directly to the wing warping so that 
the, the cables are hooked to each other. When they do the wing warping, it automatically will move the rudder. It works perfect. The pieces of the puzzle are now coming together. We've got wing warping, controlling, roll, the elevator controlling pitch, and the rudder controlling yaw. I mean, these are the three axes of flight that we know now. About this time, though, the camp is getting a little crowded. Brother Lorne, the older brother, not the oldest, but just older than them, Brother Lorne showed up unexpectedly. The letters written home by the guys really got the better of his curiosity. And then Octave Chanute, Pratt, Herring, they also show up that year. Uh, Chanute and company brought with them a triplane glider. He had originally offered this glider to the brothers uh, to help in their testing, but they had declined. But uh, Chanute brought the glider that was designed by him and Herring. And Herring would be the test pilot and fly it, thinking that they would be able to help the brothers in their testing. This is the glider, and there's Herring hanging on from it. Um, the glider, the triplane, was a disaster. It didn't work. Uh, and they tested it for a day just to be nice to them, but they were getting at best 50 feet out of the glider. Um, and remember, Orville and Wilbur are now getting, you know, three, four hundred feet. Uh, so Herring left a day later, understandably jealous of the right success. And the remaining visitors helped them launch their glider again and again and again, sometimes making as many as 75 flights a day. I mean, this is just working really well now. Um, Chanute also brought with him interesting news of Samuel Langley. Samuel Langley is the third director of the Smithsonian. He's also interested in aviation and trying to solve the problem in aviation. Um, if you remember in 1896, he launched, because he's the director of the Smithsonian, he lives in DC. He does all of his experiments on, on, the, on the Potomac. He, there's a houseboat and he puts a launch on top of the houseboat and his airplane actually lands, his glider lands in the water. Um, so Chanute tells him that, you know, Langley is going ahead now with uh, his design and the army who gave him the money to help with the design, gives him a deadline of 1903 to demonstrate that Langley can do what he promised he would do, or they would withdraw their support. Um, the brothers best flying came in late October. By the time, you know, late October comes around, Wilbur is making a glide of 622 feet. Orville is doing 615 feet. And uh, but now they're that they've heard what's going on with Langley, they're getting to be a little concerned. I mean, they had gained considerable knowledge and experience in designing and building now for three years, uh, but they never thought they could actually beat the great Dr. Langley. But you know, after the success they're having, they now think it might be a possibility. Um, on October 24th in 1902, the Wright brothers conducted their first experiment directly related to powered flight. Uh, the wings twisted along their span. But in this experiment, the Will and Orv rigged the control system so only the wingtips twisted. The center section remained rigid. What they wanted to do is pretend that an engine and a pilot was going to be on the middle. So that had to be stiff. Only the tip of the wings could uh, warp. And it worked just fine in that configuration. They packed up and left for Dayton. Their soaring, gliding adventures, you know, um, 
were set aside, now they're refocusing their efforts on becoming the first to successfully fly a powered aircraft. The race with Langley is on. Um, remember, initially this starts out as a hobby because of what they read about Otto Lilienthal and their interest and all of that stuff. But now, you know, getting answers to the questions they had they get to a point where they think, you know, we might be able to take it to the next step, put an engine on this, and we will be the first ones to fly and work on an airplane. Um, Langley is still in Washington working on his, just for comparison of the resources. This is a picture of the inside of the brother's hangar where they work on their machine. And this is the inside of Dr. Langley's workshop. Uh, keep, in, keep in mind there, look at what the propeller that Langley is designing. It's more of a paddle, isn't it? But we'll get back to that later. But anyway, now they arrive back in Dayton. They go right to work on the next design. They're excited. This is working. Orville got to work on the new wind tunnel, bigger, faster speed and ran more checks on the lift and the drag figures that they had. Wilbur writes to uh, nine different gasoline engine manufacturers. He says, we need an engine. And he wants to know delivery, price, all of that. But the engine cannot weigh more than 180 pounds. And it's got to deliver at least eight horsepower. Um, none of them will answer that they can do it. They either, turn, either they can't build one of something or they can't meet the horsepower requirement or the weight is too heavy. For whatever reason, they can't do it. So fortunately, they've got with them, the guy that they hired was Charlie Taylor. Charlie Taylor, before working on bicycles and before welding bicycle frames, had worked in a garage. So they turned to Charlie and they said, you know, do you think we can maybe build our own engine? And they said, why not? You know, they decide to try and build one themselves. Charlie remembers saying, he says, uh, we didn't make any drawings. He said, one of us would sketch out the part, cut it, and, you know, try to make it fit and see how it would work. And that's how they developed the engine. They also by now start to turn their attention to the other half of the propulsion system, the propeller. All the other designers, including uh, Langley there is using angled blades that turn kind of like a screw, but that won't do for Orville and Wilbur. They set out to engineer their propeller the same way they did for the wings. And another fundamental breakthrough comes during one of these discussions. It becomes apparent to the brothers, the propeller is not just a, a wing, but it's, uh, it's not a screw, but a rotating wing is what I'm trying to say. Um, it's, War Orville later wrote in his diary, with the machine moving forward, the air flying backwards, the propeller turning sideways, and nothing standing still, it seemed impossible to find a starting point from which to trace the various reactions. So all those answers don't come in a brilliant flash of instant recognition. They just step by step, test by step, reason through the problems. Uh, this is the engine they ended up building after six weeks. And instead of eight horsepower, that they had initially expected. It started at the, at the start, it developed 16 horsepower, and then after a few seconds, it levels off to 12. They ran it for the first time in February 1903. On the second day of those testings, the bearing froze, and they had to start all over. Uh, by May, month and a half, two months later, Charlie had the rebuilt engine running smoothly. You know, by now, Octave Chanute, they, they had been writing quite often, and now there's not that much correspondence. 
uh, Octave Chanute writes to them and he's quite curious, but they didn't tell him what they were doing on the engine. Um, you know, they, they told him that they were thinking about it, that they were working on this problem, but they weren't telling him they actually were designing their own engine. They, they told him, you know, if they found it satisfactory, they would proceed, try to add a motor later on and so on. And Chanute also said, you know, how about, you know, when we come visit this year, and Wilbur said, well, maybe, he says, you could come, but we have so much to do and so little time to do it. You know, he wasn't encouraging him to come this time. The 1903 machine is almost completed. It's larger, bigger, sturdier than the predecessors. Each wing is built in three sections. The outer portion, flexible for wing warping, the center section is rigid for the engine and the pilot. There's a hip cradle that they designed for wing warping and the rudder operation. Remember, they're linked together. A hand control for the elevator is now uh, like the wings. This is, and on the right side, you see the lever that's for the engine on and off. It's not a throttle. You either turn it on, you turn it off. The anemometer and all that is mounted on the very front spar. So uh, this is the 1903 flyer at the Smithsonian. We have a mannequin that represents Orville to show people how you would lay on it. So I'm using this picture and you can see how the hip cradle works. So he's got one hand to turn the engine off in case of problems. He's got the elevator in the other hand his feet are just holding himself in, and the cradle, he shifts with his hips left to right to move the cable that does the wing warping. Um, this picture shows the plane when it's completed. This, you're looking at it from the front here. It's a pusher, meaning the propellers are in the back. Uh, they also devised the launch system because carrying the machine to the top of the dune is now impossible. I mean, uh, it weighs about 600, 610 pounds. Plus, if they're going to prove that the machine is capable of sustained flight, it cannot be launched from a hill. It would just be considered a glider, even if it was powered. So they construct a 60-foot rail down the, the which the, the plane will ride on bicycle wheel hubs. Again, you know, whatever we got around the shop, the bicycle wheel hubs will just spin freely along the, the railing as they're going down the ramp. There's no wheels. You can see there's no wheels on it because it's in the sand and wheels would just, you know, not turn freely in the sand. So it's on skids. Um, and, 1903 now is going to be a very different season from the previous years. Uh, before, the emphasis was always on testing, learning new things, measuring, drag, lift, all of that. But now there's only one goal. 1903 is to get the powered machine off the ground in sustained and controlled flight. On September 23, 1903, Wilbur, Orville, and as Wilbur called it, their whopper of a flying machine left for Kitty Hawk. This time the trip is made in record time. Um, no problems, no hurricanes, none of that. They arrived on the 26th, three days later, and they set to work right away on repairing the camp. Uh, every year there's, you know, winds, hurricanes, whatever, sandstorm, the blow the, blow the, the the sheds down, so they have to rebuild them. Um, and they also asked Dan Tate, remember, I mean, William Tate, uh, to work on a new building to house this new, much bigger machine. Uh, storm after storm kept coming across the Outer Banks uh, during the time temperatures drops lower every night. So they built a makeshift stove to keep warm. They restored the 1902 glider 
They flew it for practice while they were working on the 1903 airplane. And by November, by the beginning of November, everything's ready for testing. Uh, the first trials don't go well. The propeller shafts cracked the first time they ran it. They had to send it back to Dayton, which would waste valuable time. George Pratt had come down for a visit and he offered to go back to Dayton with the shaft. Charlie Taylor will rebuild them and then they'll ship them back down to Kitty Hawk. Octave Chanute arrives now, but it's cold, windy, rainy. They're not really doing anything. So he left after a few days. The repaired shaft arrives back in camp on November 20th. After walking out with, the procket, with the, a problem with the sprockets coming loose and all that, they run the engine again. After several run-ups, they discover another crack in the other propeller shaft. I mean, can you just imagine what they felt like at that time after waiting all this time? Orville described this as their darkest hour. This time, Orville says he will go back to Dayton, uh, build with Charlie two new shafts, rock hard, steel uh, spring steel shafts, and he arrives back in Kitty Hawk on December 9th. So we're now up to December 9th. But before continuing with the rights, remember Dr. Langley, right? He's still busy doing his thing and he promised the government that he would do his flight in 1903. So by the way, Samuel Langley is an astronomer by, tr by trade. He's not a, uh, an engineer. And he's also trying to solve the problem. His, his previous um, glider flew almost 5,000 feet and it was steam powered. So he got $50,000 to make that machine into a full flying machine. But remember I said he wasn't an engineer and there's any engineers in the audience, you'll know exactly what I'm saying, that when Mr. Langley took the measurements from his glider and basically just quadrupled all the measurements, that's not really going to work, right? Because you change a lot of things there. Um, he tested his design in October, October 7th. And now the brother got news that Langley's uh, machine has failed in October from Chanute when he comes. Langley figured the reason his flight failed is because of a center of gravity. So he fixes that up and he makes another attempt to fly on December 8, December 8, 1903. Now, if he's successful, I'm not talking to you today about the Wright brothers uh, because everybody will know Dr. Langley was the first one. So that day, crowds gather along the banks of the Potomac to watch this historic moment or what they think is going to be a historic moment. Charles Manley, Charlie Manley is the designer of the engines. Octave Chanute is an older gentleman. He doesn't want to get into control of the airplanes. Uh, so Charlie Manley gets behind the controls. He revs it up, the engine stalls, revs it up again, keeps it going. And just like in October, as soon as they leave the launch, drops right into the Potomac. The wings snapped right on the, on the launch. And let me show you, this is the picture of his design, the grand aerodrome they call. Uh, notice the differences with what, uh, yes, this is a picture at Udvar Hazi. We have it because obviously he's the director of the Smithsonian. So we have his design. Uh, but look at the differences between what the Wrights did and what he did. You know, the, he has his wings one in front of the other. You know, he doesn't realize that the, the wind turbulence over the first wing kind of negates any lift that the rear wing is going to give him. Look at the propellers. They're just paddles. Um, the engine is a success, though. He's got a very good engine, 56 horsepower. But anyway, um, this is the picture 
when it's ready to be launched on top of the houseboat. And it's not going to take off on its own. He's got a, a streetcar launch system on there that's going to push the uh, machine down the ramp. So, well, this is the picture taken right when he left the ramp. It just broke. And this is the after effect. It's in the Potomac. Um, Remember with the date I told you this was December 8th in the Potomac? It's pretty cold in that water. Uh, the, the side story to this is kind of funny, but um, the people on the banks of the Potomac, you could see in the third picture, there's the boat that's you know rowing out to get poor Mr. Manley out of the water. And the people on the banks of the Potomac said that when they got Mr. Manley back on the boat, they had to give him spirits to revive him. And when he came to, he let loose some quite colorful language. <laughs> he didn't appreciate being put in the Potomac in December. But anyway, Mr. Langley out of the way now. Let's get back to the brothers. The shafts are repaired. Uh, they spent the next week tinkering with the engine, running the plane up and down the track to figure out you know, how much speed are they getting? By December 13, there's not enough wind, but December 14 is a clear, perfect day. So they set it up. They set up their ramp right on the bottom of the, the big hill. And they flip a coin. And Wilbur wins the coin toss. So Wilbur climbs into the pilot's position. But before he's gone 40 feet, he's going too fast and it keeps him, it's hard for him to keep up. The flyer just lurches, stalls and hits nose first into the sand. Uh, the only damage really is to one of the elevator supports that cracked, but that was the end of that day. Uh, December 15 and 16, they spend making repairs. Uh, the aircraft is back on the rail. The wind is too light yet, so no attempts. But they're up early on the 17th. It's cold, clear. The wind is blowing about 24 miles an hour out of the north. Um, they're determined not to go home before succeeding. But they're also just as determined to be home by Christmas. And they put up a red flag. That was their signal, a, a red flag on the side of their hangar, their living quarters would tell the people at the life station, just not too far away, that, you know, we need help. So the folks at the life station would walk over to help the brothers. They'd been doing that for the last three years. So that morning, Adam Etheridge, Will Doe, John Daniels, uh, walked over along with uh, Mr. Brinkley. Mr. Brinkley's a lumber buyer who had hiked to the life station. You're thinking of a lumber buyer? Well, there's a lot of wrecks in the Outer Banks and the wood washes ashore, so people are collecting that wood. And a, a young man who lived with his widowed mom, he's about 14, 15 years old, his name is Johnny Moore, lives with his mom in a shack in Max Head uh, in the woods. By 10.30, the machine is set up and the engine is started. Um, Orville says, hey, Wilbur, you had your turn. Oh, well, it's my turn. So Wilbur takes his place in the pilot's position. They set up the camera at the end of the rail. And Orville is the one that had set up the camera. Uh, you know, it's not an instant thing. You got to set up the aperture, the speed, or whatever you have to set up on those with the, the plate. And Orville goes to the men standing there and says, I want you to cheer him on so loud that you will lift him up in the air. And then he gives John Daniels the button to push and says, when you see the plane lift up from the rail, push the button to take the picture. OK, so at about 1035, Orville loose the restraining wire. The machine began to move down the rail into the bitter wind. It's now 27 miles an hour headwind. Wilbur's running around along the side, 
two thirds of the way down the rail, the flyer lifts into the air. And, you know, of course, everybody cheers. Um, Wilbur, like three days before, you know, Orville kind of underestimated the effectiveness of the elevator. And he does a lot of up and down. And uh, he lands it on his own. It didn't come down in a, in a crash. He landed it 12 seconds later, 120 feet from the end of the rail. For the first time ever, a flying machine had taken off from level ground, traveled through the air, and landed under control of the pilot. You know, 120 feet is great, and it was unsteady, but just the same, it's a true flight, a human at flown. Um, Mr. Daniels, you remember he was told to take the picture, but he was also told to cheer. So when he saw the plane lift up, he cheered, then, oh, he remembered, and he pushed the button. I wonder if Mr. Daniels knew that that one day he would take one of the world's most famous photographs. This is the, the original, there's a copy, obviously, the original taken by Daniels. This is a re-digitized picture. It's an amazing picture when you look at it closely. You see Wilbur on the right side. Um, at Kitty Hawk, we have this picture really blown up big on the side of the, of, on the wall in the building. And you could see the details, you could see the steps that Wilbur ran alongside. And you can also see next to the bench, there's a clear area where you don't see uh, footsteps. That's where they started from. There's a shovel that they used to put the rail in the ground. The box is the battery to start the engine. And the bucket there is a bunch of uh, tacks for the fabric on the wind with a hammer in it. Um, at 11.20 a.m., they make a second flight. This time, Wilbur, my turn, he's at the controls. And this time, he does 175 feet. But also, he does a lot of wobbling up and down. Um, 20 minutes later, Orville flies for a third time. And this time, he goes 200 feet. Finally, at noon, Wilbur took off for his second attempt, the fourth flight. And the beginning of the flight is like the other three. He, you know, it's hard to get the touch of the elevator. I have to tell you, when I when in North Carolina, uh, obviously at the Smithsonian, you cannot touch because it's all original stuff. But in North Carolina, it's a reproduction. So we're allowed to use it to demo it uh, once in a while for people that come to visit. So I can I can show people how the elevator works. And it's on a cable. It's not an easy thing. You really got to push it or pull it to get it to work. So I could see why it would take Wilbur and Orville, but in this case, Wilbur, time to figure out the touch. But finally, on the second flight, he gets the touch. And it stops doing the wobbling. He controls it. At about 100 feet, the airplane keeps on going. and. Then he runs into another gust of wind that sends it up and down. So he decides to put it down. This time he covered 852 feet in 59 seconds. I mean, now we really got a powered flight. Um, they're really excited. I mean, Orville runs down with the other guys and just really, really excited about this. The, the, you know, the good news is you travel 852 feet. The bad news is you got to bring 610 pounds worth of airplane back to the starting line. So they pick up the plane. They're, they're bringing in back Orville, super excited, thinks, you know, tells Wilbur, I think I can make it to Kitty Hawk next. Kitty Hawk's about a mile up the road. So they're really excited about that. They put an airplane down next to their starting point. And they warm up their hands just talking. And next thing you know, a gust of wind comes and sends the plane nose to tail over the ground. And Mr. Daniels tries to hang on to it, 
Orville tries to hang on to it. Orville lets it go, but Daniels keeps holding on and he goes for a ride, let's say, and they run up to him because they're afraid maybe he got hurt, but he's okay, he doesn't have a scratch. The plane, however, is quite damaged. It's not gonna fly again. Um, they, it would take a lot more time to fix it and they promised they'd be home by Christmas. So um, they, that was gonna be the end. That was gonna be the last flight of the day. Um, Johnny Moore, you remember the young boy, um, he's so excited. And, and also remember these people have seen what the brothers have done the last three years. So they're quite aware of what they just witnessed. Johnny Moore runs down to the village of Kitty House. He's shouting. He goes, they done it, they done it, danged if they ain't flew. You know, now the rights are a little better control of their grammar, a little bit more sedate than Ian. Uh, they ate a quiet lunch and then they walk up to the Kitty Hawk Weather Bureau to send a telegram. Now you can't send a telegram because there's no telegram office in Kitty Hawk, but there's a phone where you could call the guy who's in Norfolk at the telegram office. So this is what Orville dictated uh, to the person on the other end, to the telegraph. It says, success, four flights Thursday morning, all against 21 mile an hour wind, started from level with engine power alone, average speed through the air, 31 miles, longest 59 seconds, it's a typo, supposed to say 59. The guy typed in 57. Please uh, inform press home by Christmas, Orville Wright, or, uh, you know, he didn't spell his name. So the guy on the other end, right, Orville, Orville uh -huh. Wright. Uh, the Norfolk operator, the guy on the other end who's receiving the message says, wow, hey, I've got a buddy who's a news reporter with a Norfolk Virginian pilot. Can I tell him about this? The brother says, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. We want this to come from Dayton. We want the news to come out of Dayton. Um, but guess what? He goes ahead and tells his brother. Uh, now, of course, all the newspaper guy has is these couple sentences. So he has to expand on that a little bit. Uh, the Virginian pilot the next day fabricated a totally inaccurate story that was published. The, the story had the headline, flying machine sourced three miles in teeth of a wind over sand hills and waves at Kitty Hawk. You know, they offered the story to the Associated Press. Uh, it was carried by 21 newspapers. That night, Bishop Dad Milton receives a telegram at their house in Dayton, shows it to Catherine, Catherine shows it to Lauren, who takes it to the local newspaper, and the local newspaper wants nothing to do with it. You know, if it had been 57 minutes, maybe, but 57 seconds, they're not interested. But anyway, the next day, they read uh, one of the papers that had carried their story, and it talks about, um, it, it's full of errors. I mean, you talk about fake news, they just made up this stuff. So the machine flew for three miles. Um, it had three engines, six blade propellers. And, you know, it's just, they, they describe how uh, Orville ran around shouting Eureka, which of course, none of it happened. The, the boys are, the rights are mystified. Uh, such a short, low key message could have gone so wrong. They prepare a correct story on January 5th. Um, and they ask him, they ask the Associated Press to please print the correction. And they did, and not all the newspapers, but a bunch of them carried the corrected story uh, the next day. So the brothers arrived home the evening of December 23rd in time for Christmas. Uh, their niece, Lauren's daughter, Ivanette Miller, you know, Never mind, the brothers just flew an airplane for the first time. She says, oh, goody, Uncle Will is in tone to carve the Christmas turkey. 
So there you go. I, I promised I would take you through the first flight and we did just that. Um, we could spend a whole other time to keep going about what happened after that day. Um, by the time they, they knew exactly, well, let me just say they applied for a patent in 1902 and it was rejected. So they hired a lawyer to put another request and that patent was accepted. This is it, it was granted in May, 1906. Um, the patent, by the way, is not for an airplane. The patent is for the three axes of flight, pitch, roll, and yaw. Um, now they continued to do some flying, but they didn't go back to Kitty Hawk, not for a few years. They did all the testing at Huffman Prairie outside um, Dayton. Now I've got some more pictures to show you that we'll get to the question and answers, okay? Um, whoops. This is Wilbur doing flights at Huffman Prairie. By 1905, they, they can fly 40 minutes in the air. This is a picture of the two brothers walking. This is them, Wilbur's the bald one, by the way, Orville with the mustache, sitting on the porch of their house. Uh, Catherine, the sister with the binoculars, watching Wilbur fly. And speaking of Catherine, this is her in the airplane taking her first flight. Notice the rope tied around the dress around her ankles. It's a proper lady, you're not gonna show her ankles. <laughs> and also notice now they're sitting up. Uh, Orville has the elevator and the wing warping in his hands. Uh, this is a picture in 1928 of the dedication of the spot where they lifted off in Kitty Hawk. There's Orville holding his hat. The lady on the right is Amelia Earhart. Uh, 1928 is when she becomes the first woman to fly the Atlantic as a passenger, but she was the first woman to fly the Atlantic. Uh, this is a certificate that shows a piece of wooden fabric from the 1903 flyer that was taken to the moon on Apollo 11. And since I've done this, there's, not sure if you saw the news, there's a piece of the wing fabric that is on the helicopter that is in Mars right now doing its flight. Uh, the brothers and Catherine walking around in Washington, DC, always dressed like the gentleman. And again, the brothers, the uh, president, Taft is in the middle. Wilbur's on the president's right, Orville's on his left. Catherine there in the white dress. Uh, this, I, I love these pictures. There's Orville with his hands behind his back. And the guy on the far end there with his hands in his pocket, that's Jimmy Doolittle. Uh, it just looks like a a bad, you know what, you know, like Jimmy Doolittle is or was. But anyway, and so we've seen Amelia Earhart, Jimmy Doolittle, there's Orville with Lindbergh. Uh, I love this one. This is a drawing that was made in the newspaper after uh, Wilbur's death in uh, May 1912. I think it's pretty cool how they did that. Uh, if you go down to Kitty Hawk, this is what it looks like now. This is the, the one on the right with the door is their first hangar with the living quarters. Once in a while, when we have extra volunteers, we'll uh, open up the place for people to walk in. If not, it's a glass, you can look through it. And then the other one is a hangar that was built for the glider. This is the rock you saw that Orville dedicated. Um, it shows the liftoff spot on, and then you see there are uh, marble rocks that show one, two, three, four, the four flights of the day. And if you go to Dayton and Woodland Cemetery now, this is the plot of the Wright family. Uh, Milton and Susan are in the middle in the pointy headstone. Uh, the, the twins that died at birth are next to them. And in the front there on one side is Wilbur, Catherine's in the middle and Orville's on the other end. So there we go. I will um, 
Any questions? Anybody want to? Do we have any questions in the chat? So, uh, hey, Chris, did you have a video to show? It's five minutes long. I could show it if you want, but I figured I'm already over time. Well, go ahead and show the video. Go okay, ahead and show the video. We we'll still have a little bit of time for questions. Go ahead and show the video. Okay. I might have yes, noticed and, this. And there's no sound to it, folks. So don't worry about that there's no sound. There you go. So this is taken in 1909 when Wilbur is in France at Le Mans doing demonstrations. There is not enough wind. So he's using the same launch system that they used when they did their testing in Dayton. And there's a, like a big tripod derrick thing where they're they'll drop a weight and the weight will pull a cable that will launch them off the ramp. You'll, you'll see it in action in a minute. But that's Wilbur. See the two propellers kind of rotating. That's one thing they figured, better two propellers than one. One would have to go too fast and cause too much vibration. To me, that, that's the big difference between the Wrights and anybody else trying to do this. Between 1901 and 1902, they there's the system, yeah. They engineered aviation, which is how they came up with their invention. By the way, you might see this video on YouTube with people saying, Oh, this is the first flight in Kitty Hawk. It's not. There's no video of that flight. There's only a picture. This is in 1909. Orville is in the United States doing a demo for the US government, and Wilbur is in France. You saw the, the turning, the control. I think, yeah, there you go, he landed. This is the one where he lands. Pretty smooth landing. Look at the, the modified wheelbarrow that they've designed to pick up the plane. Basically, a wheelbarrow with a big wheel on the on it, and you'll see Wilbur in a second. Yeah, there it is. Now, Wilbur is not, I'm guessing anyway, trusting anybody else to do this, so he's going to put it exactly where it needs to be. It sure beats carrying a 610 pound machine every time. <laughs> oh, that's a uh, Mr. Oberg and Hartberg and his wife. Uh, he will be, I don't know if he is by now, but he will be the rights representative for uh, any sales of Europe. It's kind of cool look, so to see people uh, I'm guessing being in a motion picture, a moving picture in 1909 was, was a pretty big deal. And oh, by the way, no seat belts. It's a, the sun. And there you go. Towing the airplane. Everybody put on the car. <laughs> I 
We have this video in Kitty Hawk on the wall, but it's it's a it's a compressed version. Okay. All right, we'll take some. I think we already have some uh, questions in chat. Uh, Trudy, do you have some already? Uh, yes, if I could, I'm combining two questions. One is, at what age were Wilbur and Orville when they made the first flight? And the part two to that is, did they die of natural causes? Um, yeah, they are, let's see, 1903. I think they're 35 and 33. Wilbur's the older one. Did they die of natural causes? Yes, Wilbur died of typhoid fever in 1912. Um, Orville died of a second heart attack in 1948 in January. So Orville, if you think about it, lived through all of the World War II stuff. Okay, uh, Sub, I have one more question. Are the rights credited with designing an early catapult system? Good question. I don't know about the catapult system, if they were the first one to use it. I tried to Google it. I couldn't find an answer quick yeah, enough. <laughs> and honestly, I can't think what other circumstance would cause somebody to have a catapult like that that they could have just copied. Uh, good one. Thank you. I'm, you know, I hate you because now you're going to force me to do more <laughs> reading and more research. But that's a great question. I hadn't thought of that. I got to find that the answer. That is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> just I'm, kidding. I'm, I'm scrolling through. I do not see see any other questions. If Suba or Don or Lizzie see something that I missed, please bring it now up. What, I will ask Tom Crouch. Tom is uh, the, the curator. He's retired now, but I've kept in touch with the Smithsonian. I bet he knows that answer. He might save me a lot of research. I'll, I'll email Tom. If I do, I'll send it to one of you guys and you can uh, post the answer somewhere. I think there was one other question. Why did they name an Air Force base after Langley? Yeah, good question. Not just an Air Force base, but an aircraft carrier. The very first aircraft carrier is named after Langley. Uh, for, for a long time, people thought Langley, that, that's a whole other story, but Langley was thought to have the first airplane that was capable of flight. Whether he actually flew it or not, it was capable of flight, which is why the brothers uh, refused to give the Smithsonian their machine. It's not until 1947 uh, that the Smithsonian agrees, yeah, yeah, you're right, okay, you guys were first. And they had to put it in writing that the brothers were indeed the first ones. And then after that, only after that, they got that letter that did Orville agree to have the flyer sent to the Smithsonian. Now, it's a good thing that happened when it did because Orville died in January 48. The, the Smithsonian didn't get the glider until later in that summer. Uh, but for a long time, Mr. Langley was credited as having the first capable of flight, whether he was the first one to do it or not. They even, um, uh, contracted with Glenn Curtis to take Mr. Langley's machine, to take the Grand Aerodrome, fix it up, and prove that it could have flown. Well, Glenn Curtis did it, but you, you, you should Google it. You should look at it. The differences are, it's like night and day. It's not the same machine. But, you know, that's, they really wanted their guy to be, to be the first one. So... Chris, we'll finish with this uh, question before I finish with my closing comments. Did the brothers actually build the planes or did they just design them and supervise the construction? No, they did all the building themselves, the cutting of the wood, the, the, the cables, the, the stitching of the wing fabric. Everything was done 
in the back of their bicycle shop. The bicycle shop, the, the later bicycle shop, they had more than one because as the business grew, they moved it around. But the later bicycle shop would have the, the, the shop in the front of the store. The print shop was upstairs and in the back of the store where all the machines were, was where they did the bicycle works on one side and then a little further to the back door was where they would do all of the building of the airplanes. If you, um, yeah, I mean, it's not in Dayton, it's actually in Michigan, the bicycle, the big bicycle shop, but that's another story. Henry Ford bought the house and bought the shop and moved it to Greenfield Village in Michigan. But uh, if you ever go visit it, they've got a pretty good reproduction of the the, all the stuff inside the shops. Okay. Sorry, I, I, there is one question that was very interesting. Although the rights were first, Chris, who else was closed with practical aircraft that might have actually worked? Who else was close? Yes. Um, a, a couple people, uh, Santos Dumont, and as a matter of fact, the Brazilian, you know, whenever I get Brazilians that come to the museum, they're very quick to point that out. Um, but his uh, machine was actually a balloon that had an engine on it. Now he was able to direct it. And later in 1906, he came out with a 14 bis, which actually flew. It was an airplane that flew. In France, there's a Blériot, Henry Farman. They all came out with stuff in 1905, 506. Okay. Well, thank you, Chris. That was amazing. And I'm glad you we uh, got to see that video. I had never seen that. Um, but there have been several things in the chat about a part three and Chris and I were do talking about that. And yes, I'm going to get together with Chris about Wright Brothers, did you know sort of a part three to this. And um, I'll set that up with him and we'll get that information out to you. But anyway, for this afternoon, Chris, on behalf of ARP Virginia, I'd like to thank you so much for sharing your valuable time and knowledge with us. Uh, it's amazing. Um, we could have stayed here the entire afternoon listening to you. It is so amazing. truly amazing. Uh, anyway, folks, we'd like to get your feedback on today's program and ideas for future programs. In the chat box, you'll see a link to a survey. Please click on the link and take a few moments to share your feedback with us. We'll send you this link in a follow-up email later today. Um, I know a lot about the Wright brothers, but something I learned today was um, that they were sort of not competing, but I didn't know Langley was in the picture. Uh, having been both to Langley Air Force Base and Wright Pad, I find that very interesting. Also, uh, we hope to see you in two weeks for our next program of Tuesday Explorers on Tuesday, May 11th at 1.30 Eastern Standard Time. We'll take a virtual tour of the National Portrait Gallery and see highlights of the American presidents from different periods and showing different types of portraiture. Starting with George Washington and the famous Lansdowne painting, this tour will include many other Gardner's cracked plate photograph of Abraham Lincoln, Elaine D. Koenig's portrait of John F. Kennedy, and of course, Kehinde Wiley's portrait of Barack Obama. In the, in the chat box, you will see a link to our online calendar and you can click on to, to see, sign up for this up, upcoming Tuesday Explorer program and many of our other events. Until then, as we say in ARP, stay curious and uh, keep exploring. So thank you, folks. And uh, thank you again, Chris. And Chris, I'll be in touch with you. Okay, looking forward to it. Have a great afternoon, evening, whatever you are, rest of the day. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
Don, Lizzie, I'm going to sign off, but thank you for your help and support today.